Russ established this sermon series to look at various aspects of complaining. So we've been complaining a lot here on Sunday nights uh, and looking at what complaining means and doesn't mean. Um, and the, there's a subtle distinction in the biblical record between bringing a biblical complaint and complaining. Could it be a question regarding the nature of things that seem to be not right? Or is it grumbling because things are not working out in one's favor? That's somewhat the distinction between bringing a complaint, recognizing that things aren't right, and why is this, God? And murmuring or grumbling because it's not working out like you would like it to do. And it also matters significantly whether or not the complaint is directed to God or or even more so, it's about God. Some of the sermons help us to know this difference better. Some of the sermons let us see how to change when the complaining is mere grumbling. And that's what we've been doing and seeing this. And we're going to look in a passage in Jeremiah. Um, And when I was assigned Jeremiah, uh, the first thing I told my wife is, Russ must be punishing me because he always gives me the Old Testament text to have to wrestle with. And I will confess here, I didn't wrestle with the Old Testament text quite as much um, this time. And we're going to have kind of a sort of Bible lesson that comes out of Jeremiah 12 and surrounding. Um, So I, I, I kind of... I reneged a little on that, but it'll be fine. We'll have a good time, I think, tonight with what we're doing. But you know, there are those whose routine response to injustice, sin, calamity, or struggle is to pretty much say to themselves, so what? What's the big deal? I don't really care. You know, Doris Day's song that that first came from the Hitchcock movie, The Man Who Knew Too Much, and then was used as a theme song for her television show, the the Doris Day show. Who's old enough to remember the Doris Day show? There's probably a few, okay? But you probably all heard, que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. Um, That approaches... Many people's approach to life. That, that song sums it up. Who cares? Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I don't care. Why do we care? Why do we worry about it? Now, that's a little different than someone who's trying to be positive, looking for the silver lining in the black cloud. That, that's different. This, this idea is like, I, I don't care. They don't seem to be moved by what's swirling on around them. Now, there are other people on the other side of the spectrum. They're on the other extreme. And every struggle is for life and death. Every little conflict, emotions run high and hot. Yet, the message in the Bible seems to indicate that both problems need to be modified and perhaps moved together. We should care and care deeply about sin and injustice, death and desolation but then we should be calm and trusting, patient and long-suffering in the fear of such concerns. But tonight, we'll be looking at how we should think when we take our complaints to God. We're going to kind of play with this as a little Bible lesson and have some fun. So let's start off with praying. Father, just help us to look at your word tonight and bring some clarity to enjoy this time of listening to you in your word about thinking about who you are. So as we do this, bless your word, bless each heart that it would indeed be open and receptive to hear and grow and if need be, change as we finish this evening and leave this place. We love you. We are thankful that you love us and care for us. Be with us through the rest of the evening here. It's in your son's glorious name that we can pray. Amen. So turn in your copy of scriptures to the book of Jeremiah. It's kind of right in the middle. 
so it's not that hard to find. Turn to the book of Jeremiah and chapter 12. Now, Jeremiah, like the other major writing prophets, Isaiah and Ezekiel, are a bit hard to read. Partly because they're kind of long. And they don't always seem to make sense. They seem to be bouncing from idea to idea. There's some story embedded, and then there's these long sections of poetic, prophetic announcements. And and it's just hard to get a handle on what's going on from beginning to end. There's 66 chapters in Isaiah. It's a long book. And there are 52 in Jeremiah. It's a long book. They're just long. And so it takes a while to get there. You know, looking at Thessalonians, like we're doing on Sunday morning, First and Second Thessalonians, they're small. You can get a pretty good handle on Thessalonians. It's hard to get a handle on Jeremiah. So what we happen to do most of the time, we commonly mine them for little theological nuggets. We find our favorite little passage here, our favorite little saying here, this great little passage here, and we get them and we say, oh, then this is great, but we really never really wrestle with the meaning of the book. And those meanings do have, those little nuggets have deep meaning, they have deep application, but we really don't understand where they fit. And so when you look at these books, I know I am wrestling, trying to, I'm trying to get a better handle on Jeremiah and Isaiah anyway. So when Russ assigned me a text to Jeremiah, I went, he would do that. I'm still struggling with trying to figure out what Jeremiah is doing in that whole picture. I have some general statements I can make, but I want to know more what Jeremiah doing so I can put that together. So he's like, ah, now what am I going to do with preaching out of 12? So... And that's why we run the risk then when we fall into a single chapter to kind of mill around and find some thematic substance. And we risk not reading that book correctly or even doing justice to the context of the passage. And so that's close to what we're going to be doing tonight. We're going to run the risk of not really doing it right. We're not reading it correctly. We're not going to apply it correctly because we're diving into chapter 12 and finding something out of chapter 12. And that's really not good. You heard me say it. Okay? And now I'm going to do it anyway. Okay? I don't like it. Really. But we can, we'll find out we get some amazing things here, even if we do it wrongly. But to do that, you really at least have to have some preliminary understanding of the setting and overall message of the prophecy of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, with the other writing prophets in the Hebrew Bible, follows the historical books Joshua through Kings. The story of the Israelites after the Exodus that runs from Joshua to Kings is one of ultimate failure. You start off in Joshua and things seem like they're going to go okay. We get this conquest and we go to Judges and it's a mess. And we walk through Samuel and we things seem to be regrouping and, and Samuel takes charge and then David comes on the scene and leads the way and the temple is built and we've got the wise Solomon and then it starts to fall apart again and the rest of the book of Kings just falls apart. That's the storyline of that part of the Bible. And then we come to Isaiah, Jeremiah, and then Ezekiel. Hmm. What's going on there? Jeremiah is writing just before and then immediately after the fall of Jerusalem and is explaining the exile to his audience. First, to the people in Jerusalem that he's hanging out with and trying to teach them and coordinate with them. And then the writing then is handed back and finally codified. And then we have it to understand what really went on there. What really went on? Why did they fail? Why did they fall? But he actually does more than just explaining their failure. He points out that God's program extends beyond this calamity and looks to the future when God will do something glorious and wonderful. In chapter 11, if you take your eyes and go there or turn the page if you need to, right before the passage we have for the evening, God instructs Jeremiah to remind people of that old covenant that he made with them that they were to start with. Let's just go to verse 1 of chapter 11. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord... Hear the words of this covenant and speak to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, cursed be the man who does not hear the words of this covenant that I commanded your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace saying, listen to my voice and do all that I command you. So you, so shall you be my people and I will be your God. 
that I may confirm the oath that I swore to your fathers and give them a land flowing with milk and honey at this, as at this day. And then I answered, so be it, Lord. And that's actually what they said too at that time. When God commanded them, they said, sure, tell us what you want us to do and we're going to obey you. And then we found out through Joshua to Kings that didn't quite work that way. Matter of fact, we didn't even have to get out of Exodus before we realized it wasn't going to work out very well. Even the whole section of Genesis to Deuteronomy is really telling us how the law fails. If you read that first five books of Moses carefully, it really tells us how things are failing and we should be expecting something better. So sometimes we go back and we read, oh, this is the law. Yeah, it does. It tells us the law, but it's also telling us in the storyline of that that the law messes up and it falls apart and fails. So he goes along in that chapter and says, The Lord once called you a green olive tree, beautiful with good fruit, but with the roar of a great tempest, he will set fire to it and its branches will be consumed. The Lord of hosts who planted you has decreed disaster against you because of the evil that the house of Israel and the house of Judah have done, provoking me to anger by making offerings to Baal. That's kind of the storyline of most of what Jeremiah is telling them. It's because you never read the covenant, or you didn't follow the covenant. Did you not pay any attention to what was going on back there? That's why. This is it. This is going to be ugly. It's really ugly. And he's feeling it. It's really ugly. And he's like struggling with it. It's really ugly. But we all know where the book goes when we come at least to chapter 31. Chapter 31 is one we all know. We're, we're happy with. We like chapter 31. Matter of fact, the whole chapter is a great read. Even back into 30, 31, 32, it's, it's a great passage to kind of go along there. But we're just going to look at these most familiar verses here in verse 31 of chapter 31 where he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after, the, after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people, and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And we've read the back of the book, so we know exactly what he's talking about. They might have been struggling there reading Jeremiah, but we know he's going that Jesus is forgiving their sins and makes a new covenant and allows his law through his spirit to live within us and we will know him. That's great. But even though Jeremiah kind of gets what's going on with what's happening around him, he, he gets it, he understands it, he's trying to explain it to him, and he even has a sense that, that what's going on in the future, and God is explaining that to him, he still is unsettled. A lot of Jeremiah and then his companion volume, The Lamentations, is pretty much his trying to figure this out and asks why. He examines the world around him. He can't quite make it all make sense. So we have a little hint of that in chapter 12. A record of one aspect of his struggle and some of its answer from God. So we're going to read from verse 1 all the way to verse 12 and then we're going to focus on the first four verses for tonight's conversation. But I want us to put that in, in context. So we're going to read the 12 verses. So we'll spend some time here looking at this. And then you'll understand right away why Russ assigned this text to be in the complaining series. Righteous are you, O Lord, when I complain to you. Yet I would plead my case before you. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? You plant them, and they take root, and they grow and produce fruit. You are near in their mouth, but far from their heart. But you, O oh Lord, know me. You see me, and you test my heart toward you. 
Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter. Set them apart for the day of slaughter. How long will the land mourn and the grass of every field wither? For the evil of those who dwell in it, the beasts and the birds are swept away because they said, he will not see our latter end. Now we change voice. This is God speaking. If you have raced with men on foot and they have wearied you, how will you compete with horses? And if in a safe land you are so trusting, what will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? For even your brothers in the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. They are in full cry after you. Do not believe them, though they speak friendly words to you. I have forsaken my house. I have abandoned my heritage. I have given the beloved of my soul into the hands of her enemies. My heritage has become to me like a lion in a fortress. She has lifted up her voice against me, therefore I hate her. Is my heritage to me like a hyena's lair? All the birds of the prey against her all around? Go, assemble all the wild beasts. Bring them to devour. Many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard. They have trampled down my portion. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it a desolation. Desolate, it mourns to me. The whole land is made desolate. But no man lays it to heart. Upon all the bare heights in the desert, destroyers have come, for the sword of the Lord devours from one end of the land to the other. No flesh has peace. They have sown wheat and reaped thorns. They have tired themselves out, but profit nothing. They shall be ashamed of their harvests because of the fierce anger of the Lord. He's, he's got an issue there. It's, okay, we're bad, but really? You're going to do this? This is awful. We, we failed? Yes, we might have failed the covenant, but you're bringing these guys, these Babylonians, and they're not nice people. They may be just a little better than the Assyrians that took the North Kingdom away, but they're still bad people. They're, this is bad. This is ugly. They do evil things. They're causing, this is, and people are suffering and starving, and this is not good. So in verse 1, he makes his plea, his complaint. He says, righteous are you, O Lord, when I complain to you. And yet, I would plead my case for, for you. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? He's probably talking a little bit maybe about his, the Israelite leadership. He might be talking about the coming Babylonians or the Babylonians in the midst of it. It's okay. But he expresses his complaint. He succinctly states, this is my complaint. This is where my problem is. And it was a real problem. Take your paper. We are going to take a few minutes here. And you are going to write down, I left you space for four. You at least think of one. You might have five or six. I want you to write down four complaints or so that you have right now about what's going on in your life, in your neighbor's life, in your work, in the world around you. You've got, we have complaints. Does anybody here not have something to complain about here tonight? Okay. Oh. Then you want to, anyway. <laughs> I'm certain everybody's got something that they're thinking about, something they can write down on the paper. Something may be big, something may be little. you got time, take a few minutes and write them down. He wrote down what he was struggling with that was real, tangible, visible in his life. What do you have that seems to be a problem? We are not going to share them. You don't have to read. I'm not going to say, Amy, stand up and read your first complaint. That is not happening. We are not sharing them. We're not collecting them at the end and going to publish them in the chapel weekly. Matter of fact, if you want to, at the end of the day, drop it in the trash can. No one's going to go through the trash cans and hunt down the Linda's four complaints so we can know what to pray with her. No one's doing any of that. But I do want you to take and do the exercise to sit and write a few minutes on the front part of the page. The blank back part, save it for later. But I put you four numbers on there. Think about something that you're going to complain. Put those down on paper, and I'm going to give you a little time to try to express your heart.
for those of you watching online, they're all busily working. You can go find a sheet of paper yourself and do something the same way. I don't know which camera I'm in, so I'm going to look up here at this one. All right. So write things down. Take the time to go find a piece of paper. we got a couple of minutes. It's kind of dead space. It's going to look weird. So that's why I'm kind of mumbling in there, kind of busy working. I'm not talking to them. I'm talking just to you. It doesn't happen very often. So write something down. Piece of paper. Make yourself do it. Don't just think it in your mind. These kind of exercises are pretty common in the corporate world these days. They always bring people in and want them to write stuff down or to do some exercise or whatever. And I always roll my eyes when I have to do them too, but we're doing one here. I really didn't want this to be a family entity. I wanted you to do them separately. Oh, really? Well, that's pretty cool. I made quite a few. We ran out. I have an extra... I have another one. Yeah, I have one. I also have one on the back of my manuscript we could use too if we need to. One more minute. I still people looking writing, so that's good. One more minute. And that doesn't mean you have to put it down immediately. You can finish that thought, but if you finish your thoughts, you're not listening to me. That may be good, I guess. So you can put those down, and we'll come back to them a little bit later here. So now, let's look again back at those first four verses. First of all, notice that Jeremiah begins this oracle, this little collection of texts. It's this dialogue between him and God. It's his complaint and God's answer. He begins this oracle, this complaint, with a statement about God. He says that God was righteous. So that should cause us to ask this fundamental question about our complaining. To whom do we come when we bring our complaints to God? That's the title of our series. I was given that title and a text in Jeremiah, bringing our complaints to God, Jeremiah 12. So just who is God that Jeremiah complains to, that we bring our complaints to. So we're going to look also at the surrounding context and see what else is kind of governing Jeremiah's thoughts. So when he says here that you're righteous, but he said a lot of other things that he is bringing to bear. So if we were reading from chapter 1 to chapter 12, when we would get here, we would know other things. So we're, we're going to kind of build that up a little bit and then see what Jeremiah thought about this God that he brings this complaint. 
The first thing that Jeremiah says here, and we'll start with our verse 1 of chapter 12, is Jeremiah says that God is righteous. Righteous are you. Now, righteousness is something that is, it's correct. It's just. It's good. It is clean. It is pure. All of those other adjectives and and metaphors, however you want to think about it, kind of add to the idea of righteousness. Something that is righteous aligns itself with the perfect expectation. You justify your margin on the side of your page if you want to do that, it lines it up. It aligns it with an expectation. And we could align up the walls here to make sure they're nice and straight. And it wouldn't do us any good to align it up by just our eyeballs, because that may not work. We want to actually align it with something that says this is perpendicular. And we put it there. And so we, it's righteous, it's just, when it's aligned up with that perfect expectation. One author says this about how it applies to God because he makes the comment that God is the standard and perfect expectation. He says the whole Bible is really based on this premise. And with that, it means that the God who makes promises, he will keep them. He's righteous. He makes a promise. It's going to keep it. It's it's going to align itself with that expectation. He says he makes promises and he will keep them. And he will intervene in powerful ways when the promise seems to run amok. You don't have to worry about it. God is right. And eventually, the Bible tells us he will make right all unrighteousness. That promise is scattered throughout the Bible. When Jeremiah gets there, he knows what God has said and done in the past. And he knows that God says, I am righteous and will make things righteous. And I will punish unrighteousness. And we're going to make it right. So he can start off his complaint recognizing that God is righteous. And because he is the righteous one, he is the, the standard by which everything else is judged against. He is the standard and the one who is the judge. When you take your your level and you're going to line up there and see if it's low level and you get your little bubble just going across there, you know, is it right? Yeah, it's okay. Well, the level is both the standard and then it tells you when you're wrong. And you know, you go, I got up on the side because the the level is your judge. And you can look at it and say, that's okay, I can ignore it. Well, we're talking about God. He is both the righteous one and therefore he is the judge. And if you flip back a little into chapter 10, he helps answer the question that I'm certain is under, underlying Jeremiah's comment. If God is righteous and he is the judge and he's going to make things and keep things righteous and he's not going to ignore this unrighteousness, how can he do that? These Babylonians are pretty powerful. These, the Israelites for hundreds of years and many generations have failed to keep this covenant. How can he do this? Well, in chapter 10, he tells us that God has power. In verses 12 and 13 we're going to read, he he tells us this. It is he who made the earth by his power and who established the world by his wisdom and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. When he utters his voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens. He makes the mist rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings forth wind from his storehouses. God has such power, he was able to create the entire world. All that we know exists by the utterance of his voice. It's his. He makes it. And he not only made it, he is making it. Okay? The tumult of waters, the mist, the lightning, the rain, that's him. So 
back Friday night when the thunderstorms rolled through. Yes, we can talk about the, the c clash of the cold air over the masses and the building of static electricity and the height of the cloud and the lightning going from one spark. There are reasons for that, but you know why that happens? God wanted it to. He can do it. He does it. Something is unexplainable. Why did the wind come in? Well, we can talk about the difference in high pressure and low pressure and the movement of the air. And because we're in the northern hemisphere, there's a, a certain circle that goes around and it guides the winds a certain way. And you can do all that, but it's because God does it. God has power. He has power to exact his judgment about what is righteous and what is not righteous. He can do it. And you know what? Because this is his universe that he made, he has ordained its order and he rules over that order to guarantee its proper and intended operation. Now, that was back in verse 2 of chapter 12. We saw that. Jeremiah recognized that even the evil ones were put there and operate by his decree. Did you, did you not miss that in verse 2? He says, you plant them. You put them there. You're, you're doing this. He recognizes, I don't get this. Why are you, this is evil. There's, there's treacherous people. There's evilness. But you plant them. It's part of his complaint. Even back in, in chapter 10, if you went back up a few verses to verse 10, it says, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. And that's more than what Elizabeth is in England. And she's a queen, but, and you know, when she dies and Charles takes over, or when William finally comes there, yeah, they're the king, but that's, that's not the kind of king that's here. This is the king who is the chief military officer that leads them on war, who makes the rules, who governs the people, who decides what happens when we do this, when we do that. That's how a king in the ancient Near East worked. He was the man. God is the king. God designs, determines, and rules his word. That's where Jeremiah is speaking to. That's the God that he understands. But you know what? Even that God could still be kind of messed up. You know, he could be mean. Does, is, is he, does he do this in the best and wisest way? Maybe he doesn't get all the details. He doesn't understand me. He doesn't understand. This is his pe He said it was his people. He's confused. Aren't we your people, God? God must be confused. He, he may be the guy who's in charge. He may be the standard. He may be powerful enough, but maybe he's not smart. Maybe I need to explain to him what's going on. Nope. Jeremiah understands that he does this in the best in wisest way. Again, back in chapter 10, we back up a little farther into verse 7. He says, Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your due. For among all the wise ones of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. As wise as anybody else might be, the wisest of the wise that's out there, they're not like you. They're not in the same category as you. It's not just merely, yeah, that's an interesting language there. It's not merely, you're wiser than them all. That's what that means on one layer. But it's not just that you're wiser than them all. They're not even like you. They may be wise in their way, but you, you are so much different. They're not like you. You know how this all works. You know how it does it. And you're doing it the best the way you want it, that's the perfect and best way because he's the righteous one. He's the one that sets the standard. He's that perfect expectation. It is perfect because he knows how to do it. But like we hinted at, what if he were just mean? What if he was capricious or even evil? There was a, a fellow that was in the second century of, of the New Testament era and, and, and he was influenced by some other interesting religions and some Christianity and he believed that the God of the Old Testament, 
He was the wrong kind of God. This Jehovah of the Old Testament, he's mean, he's evil, he's bad, he's not really good. We need the good God, Jesus, to come over. And so he did everything that looked like, he didn't read the Old Testament. Matter of fact, some of this New Testament stuff, like a lot of things we've been reading in Matthew, that talks about how the Old Testament's okay. Oh no, we got to get rid of that. Because that's bad. God is bad. He's mean. Could it be? Well, Jeremiah knows that God knows and loves his people. He cares for his creation. He didn't just wind it up and walk off. This God that's involved in here is not just some guy that sits back and laughs at people. He says he affirmed this in verse 3 of our chapter 12. He says, but you, O Lord, know me. That's just not that you know about me. He does that too. But it's not merely that you know me. You know me. We're in this together. You're here. You know me. You care for me. Back in verses 23 and 24 of chapter 9, he writes down what God says to him there. He says, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, nor the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. So if you're going to boast, boast that you understand who God is, that you understand and you know him, because I am the Lord who practices stead fast love, justice and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. Jeremiah knew that as he was beginning to complain to God, he was the righteous one. He had the power to maintain that righteousness and to make things that were unrighteous to bring it into his alignment. He can do that. He is in charge and rules it, has the right and the authority to do that because it's his. Smart enough to be able to do it in the best way. He's wise and careful. And he loves those that he's doing this for. He's not doing it in a way that's not caring and loving. And so because of that love and care, God knows that God has plans for redemption and restoration, even forgiveness of their sins and failures. He knows that that's somehow in God's purposes and plans. It's also in his purposes and plans to burn and cut and move and plow. But he also knows it's part of God's purposes to forgive. So if we go back earlier in Jeremiah 31, he says this. Eventually, he says, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth. Among them, the blind and the lame, the pregnant woman and she is in labor together. A great company, they shall return here. With weeping, they shall come. With pleas for mercy, I will lead them back. I will make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. It should have echoed a little bit with your Matthew understanding, right? As you read through that, you see it happening. He said, this is what's going to happen. And sure enough, that's what Jesus is doing that Matthew is telling us about. So let's summarize. God is just and righteous. He can carry out his plans because he's powerful and wise. And he does so in a manner that demonstrates true love and compassion because he has plans to bring some into close relationship because of this new covenant, which we know comes through the person and work of Jesus Christ, for all eternity. 
The situations that we face are not to be brushed aside and say, que sera, sera. Nor are they to be elevated to the ultimate calamities that I can't do anything about them. But they're to be acknowledged, struggled with, and given to God, trusting Him to be righteous. We often complain to others, our family and friends. But these complaints often are just times of grumbling. We're not really speaking to someone who knows, understands, or even plans for those concerns. We're just voicing our thoughts really to idols, things that can't listen or help us, to things that don't have any power or authority to make that change, and likely we do so just so we can maybe look good in our own eyes. If I complain to you and tell you how bad it is, you're going to say, oh, it's okay, you don't deserve that. I feel better. I didn't deserve it. That's right. Do we really come to God with understanding? Do we remember him as the powerful creator, the perfectly righteous one, the only God, king, and judge of the universe? Do we trust him as the all-wise planner and sustainer of this world, the one who has purpose and direction? Do we clearly and confidently know that he loves us, cares for us, and is bringing us into a closer relationship with him to last for all eternity? Are these thoughts real in your life? Let's go back and take your hand out. A page, you should have it. should be there close. I want you to turn that page over. Now I want you to write out a sentence or two, or three if you need to, or five or six. Just take a few minutes and write. Take the complaints that are on the other side and write it out, bringing them before God. The God that we just talked about. How do you say those to him? You shouldn't say, I don't care about these anymore because it's whatever's going to be God's in charge and throw it away. That is not what Jeremiah did. That is not the right approach. But now you should recognize that this other person says, look at all these complaints I've got. I can't deal with them. I don't know what's going to happen. Well, bring it to God. So how do you bring them to God? Take a few minutes and write on that page, bringing them to God. It's for you. Go find your paper or find your, if you're doing it in your phone or writing it down on your iPad or typing on your computer, whatever you've elected to do that, do it too. Take the minute or two that we're going to give here and write them down. Write it down. One sentence, two sentences, five sentences, however you write. I write big sentences, so I could probably do it in one, but it's going to have comma, 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 comma.
one more minute. We're not going to collect them. You don't have to even keep them. But you've had to think and be concrete. Do we complain to God? Understanding who God is. Jeremiah knew. But you know, for us, we know more than Jeremiah. We understand God should better than Jeremiah because we know that it's because of what Jesus actually accomplished in his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension. All that Jesus did that brings in this new covenant that Jeremiah only spoke about. Because of the work of Jesus, this allows us to approach God, to bring our hearts to God. As the worship team comes back up, we're going to read a passage in the book of Hebrews, that great new covenant text in chapter 10 that encourages us this way as we close. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies wa washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's stand now and reflect back to what God has given to us.